Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner with the SwineNet Podcast. Today with me, I have uh, Dr. Jay Johnson, who is a research animal scientist. How are you today, Jay? I'm doing good. How are you, Dr. Greiner? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, if you wouldn't mind maybe giving just a brief introduction about yourself to our audience, just to help them understand a little bit about who you are, that would be great. Sure. Um, so yeah, I have a background as an animal scientist, um, primarily specializing in stress and nutritional physiology. Um, I've worked with a variety of livestock species, um, beef cattle, dairy cattle, but primarily my focus um, is on swine. Um, we look at things like prenatal stress as well as postnatal stress, primarily focusing on, on heat stress and what are some of the negative outcomes of heat stress and um, what are different ways that we can actually mitigate it through the use of either management practices, um, technologies, or different nutritionally based strategies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I know when I travel around, that's probably one of the biggest topics I get asked a lot of questions on is, is heat stress, certainly in the U.S., we deal with our seasonal heat stress um, and other parts of the world, they're dealing with it many more months or all year round. So what would be some current topics that you're thinking about in terms of heat stress or what kind of pops into your mind when you start talking to people about their concerns? Well, you know, some of our focus really has been on the more sensitive populations of swine, um, particularly looking at you know the lactating sows. Um, we have some current work going on looking at different cooling technologies we can use to help mitigate some of that heat stress, um, cooling pads, for example. Um, and a lot of our interest as well, um, it goes back to my graduate student days, um, falls into the line of in utero heat stress. So how does exposure to heat stress environments while the piglets are gestating, how does that impact them negatively later in life? Um, We've you know, discovered a, a variety of, of negative effects, really, of in utero heat stress. We've yet to find a positive one. And so um, that's, that's something that we've, we've put a big focus on recently. Mm -hmm. What would be some of the traits that you see? I think in the past, I've heard discussions around even stature type and certainly potentially efficiencies. But just to kind of help clarify, what are you currently seeing in terms of in utero issues with heat stress? Sure, sure. Um, well, yeah, you mentioned stature types. So that's actually one of the one of the classic um, effects of in utero heat stress. Back in the 1950s, they were observing in, in rodent models um, where they'd have you know reduced limb size, so arms and legs, um, uh, decreased head size, um, and so these were some of the well, some of the first things we saw with in utero heat stress. In terms of our of our pigs, um, we see things like reduced feed efficiency, um, decreased growth rates. Um, we've seen issues with boar um, sperm quality and quantity. Um, we've observed recently some differences in immune function. So um, our in utero heat stress pigs actually um, are more sensitive to some of these innate immune challenges. They, they have a much greater inflammatory response. Um, we've seen things like altered body composition, um, reduced meat quality, and and really, if, if you can name a trait in a pig, we've probably observed a negative effect, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you done any disease models where you actually take those offspring and expose them to maybe a, a PERS or a flu and seeing how those pigs respond compared to non-heat stress pigs? You're reading my mind. So that's actually something that we're, we're hoping to do um, based on some of that initial work that we've done with LPS challenges. Um, we're, we're following some of that up, um, looking at some potential genomic selection techniques that we can use to select against it. I'm currently working with uh, Dr. Luis Brito um, at Purdue University on that, um, hoping to have some success. But yes, that is, that is something we'd like to do later down the line um, with this in heat stress model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting to just, again, put an additional piece of information out there, because if we think about those pigs, they're gestating in the summer, they're farrowing out late fall, early winter, and of course, we have lots of purrs and so forth in the yeah. U.S. in that time. So I think it'd be interesting to better understand what's happening there. For sure. How about the, the gilt offspring? So I think of multiplication farms going through heat stress. Mm -hmm. Do you look at anything in terms of genetic programming on those, those gilts if they're going to be maternal females? what we might see in terms of differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that has been a big question. 
I know Dr. Tim Safransky and Matt Lucy at um, University of Missouri, they'd done some of that work. Um, they did, I don't think they found um, a lot of statistical changes, but they did si find some numerical, um, some numerical differences in terms of um, like fetal, fetal sizes and things like that. Um, one of the things though that, that we're interested in, at least my group, is the impact of that in utero heat stress on susceptibility of heat stress of those replacement gills. And so one of the, the phenotypes that we see, um, one of the outcomes is actually that the, these pigs become a little bit more heat stress sensitive. Um, and so if, if we're logically speaking, if we're producing replacement gilts that are born in the summer months, you know, they're gonna reach puberty probably close to the next summer, right, in next spring. Um, the number one risk factor for producing in utero heat stress offspring is the mother becoming heat stressed. And if you have mothers that are more susceptible to heat stress because of in utero heat stress, they're more likely to pass on those negative traits to their offspring. Um, and again, in, in some of our upcoming projects, we're hoping to address some of that to see whether or not this is actually occurring or not. Um, right now, it's just kind of a best guess, but yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so I think that just adds another layer to maybe our decisions when we come to multiplication and selection is you know, mm -hmm. when were these animals born? So I think that will be actually really fascinating. Um, so we're talking a little bit about the science, but I'm sure we have some producers that are listening that are probably going, well, that all sounds really scary, right? I'm sure. losing feed efficiency, I'm losing performance, uh, potentially impacting immune function. So what can I do? So what are some things that maybe you're finding that are things that we can help alleviate some of that heat stress? Sure, sure. Well, you know, kind of like I mentioned earlier, I mean, the number one risk factor is their gestating cells is getting hot. And so the best thing we can do is, you know, invest in these technologies that are preventing that from happening. Um, but again, the first thing we need to, to understand is what is heat stress in a gestating, in a gestating animal? Um, right now, there's not really clear guidelines on what constitutes heat stress in a either a mid gestation or late gestation animal. Um, that is some work that our group has done. We've recently published a couple of papers on it, looking at thermal preference. Um, we're actually finding that our, our gestating sows are preferring temperatures as low as you know 56 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where they want to be at. Um, you know, in late and probably lactating sows are even even less, right? Because you know, with all the milk production. Um, sometimes even our lactating sows are we're keeping them up in the 70s, and that's just not where they want to go. And so really having a, a really good understanding of what are some of these thermal thresholds, especially in our more um, current genetics, as opposed to, you know, when some of these thresholds were established was 30, 35 years ago. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that's the best information we have. And we're, we're basing some of our decisions today based on that data. Um, you know, so that's that's kind of the hope of our group is to to really get, gain a better understanding of that at least in the gestating animal, um, so we can help producers really identify when the, their animals are going to be heat stressed and, and prevent some of these negative long term issues. Mm -hmm. And you brought up a couple of really interesting points in there. The the first one was the discussion about the genetics, and that's something I've seen some data on as well as that our our leaner genetics are producing more heat increments than than maybe something the 10 years ago. And so can you maybe give us an idea of, of what that looks like? Sure, sure. Um, well, some of the some of the best, at least scientific data, there's a, a paper from 2014 showing about a 16% increase in, in metabolic heat production. Um, and in terms of you know, heat stress sensitivity, you know, we when we think of heat stress sensitivity, it's it's like a balance equation, right? So on one side of the equation, you have heat gain. So it's heat gain from the body, just its basal body temperature. You have heat gain from the environment. That's when you know high ambient temperatures come into play. And you have heat gain from metabolism. So um, things like you know milk production, you know gestating fetuses, so the heat of those fetuses, and the list goes on. Or you know muscle muscle mass, right? And so more muscle mass, you get more heat production. On the other side of that equation, you have heat loss. And so things like you know conducting into the floor. You know you see a sow, it's very hot. It lays down. It's trying to get rid of heat into the floor. And then things like like panting, right? So so respiration rates and things like that. Um, it, it, if these pigs were in the wild or if they're in outdoor setting, maybe wallowing, you might add to the heat loss side. But for, for most instances, we're talking about just panting and skin loss. And so we're always trying to keep that that balance 
right in the middle so that that animal can maintain a normal body temperature. Well, if you, if you start adding over to that heat gain side of the equation, things like increasing metabolic heat production because of greater heat gain from lean mass, you start to tip the scales. And so if you add anything else, like increasing the, the, the environmental temperature a little bit, you're going to tip that scale even further. And so you're, you've already skewed it to hyperthermia to, to those pigs being hot. And then you add a little bit more environmental heat on it. And then that that's when you're getting the heat stress occurring. Um, and so really, again, it's just, we're, we're, we've, you know, it's great because we have higher, more efficient pigs. They, they produce well. That's great. It's good for, you know, food security. Um, it's good for the producer. It's, it's great. But we also have to consider how do we better manage those animals, you know, in a rapidly um, changing environment, right? We know it's, it's obviously getting hotter. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other part of that, and maybe we should take a step back is really defining heat stress. So um, I've talked to some scientists where, well, we turn up the barn temperatures and maybe they reduce feed intake for, mm -hmm. you know, a half a day to a day, but then they adapt very quickly. Sure. So there's always that argument, well, is it temperature? Is it temperature and humidity? Is it duration? And then what does adaptation look like? Because we know there is some eventual adaptation. It's, it's not 100%, but there's some mm -hmm. level. So can you maybe walk us through a little bit about how you're defining heat stress or how you believe the animal is is biologically responding to the heat stress. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think if you start at the beginning of that, right, it's, it's, you know, what is heat stress versus what are we actually measuring? So stress is what's being imposed on the animal. So the, the ambient temperature, right, that's the stressor being imposed. When we're measuring things like feed intake, uh, body temperature and things like that, that's that strain response. That's its animal's response to the stressor. And so what we're really thinking of when we're thinking about heat stress is heat strain in reality. Um, and it, it, and I, I've seen this too, and I'm sure I've been guilty of this as well, right? It's, it's hot out. I feel like it's hot. And so, oh, the animal's hot. Well, in reality, if, if we're trying to define heat stress, we, we really need individual animal measures of how they're responding to that heat stress, right? You get a, you know, you might have a room that's, you know, 90 degrees, and you have maybe two pigs of the same size, but they, they might actually respond a little bit differently to that 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so one might have a really big strain or stress response, whereas the other one doesn't. Um, and I think that's where some of these newer precision technologies are going to really help us here in the future, you know, um, partnering with, you know, these, these computer scientists and these engineers that know a lot more, obviously, than, than I do. Um, and, and how do you measure these things on an individual animal basis to really help us define you know, what is heat stress and when is it actually occurring in our animals in a real world situation, um, as opposed to simply relying on the on the dry bulb temperature. Right. So, right. Yeah. right. What about um, using thermal cameras? So I've heard some people mm -hmm. talk about particularly in a lactation or gestation barn, walking through with thermal cameras to detect which animals might be the hottest. So, you know, increased strip coolers or those or not drip coolers but you know dripping mechanisms over those animals versus others is that a, a fair measurement something our producers can do today or does that really not give us the information that we need i think it depends on the question you're asking so if your question is has there been a large change from what you consider baseline um then yes, I, I think they're really good at answering that question. Yes, there's been a large change. Maybe maybe I need to look at other factors that indicate that that animal is suffering from heat stress. If you're looking to use them as a way to actually predict that that animal, its body temperature, its internal body temperature is high, um, I have some doubts. Just because skin temperature is so linear, cor linearly correlated with ambient temperature, the environment impacts skin temperature quite a bit. Um, think about it, you know, if you were, there's a, you have a hot tub, right? You put your arm in the hot tub, your arm might be 105 degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't mean your body's 105 degrees Fahrenheit on the inside, right? So you, what they're, you're looking at a relative change from baseline, which could be informative if you bring in other measures. Um, if you're using it as a direct indicator of what the core body temperature of that animal is, um, I think you, you may have some issues, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
And I think that's something we need to consider because again, people are trying to, to find ways to implement new technology. So the camera technology in particular, the, there's been discussions about using heat signatures for lameness, sickness, mm -hmm. you know, so heat stress would obviously be one of those that people might be thinking about um, to find some way to implement it into the barn quite rapidly and have some maybe computer control, right? If they recognize the heat signatures moving up, increased misting or something like that. Um, what about just in general, if we think about heat stress throughout the day, is, is an animal experiencing the same amount of heat stress in the morning as they are in the afternoon? And how do we mitigate just even a daily difference in heat stress? Yeah, that's a that's a big question that comes up, and you know something we try to address in our research. We we always use even in controlled settings a, a diurnal pattern, um, so to, to mimic a, a normal day. Um, you know, I, I think the obvious answer is that that yes, as it gets hotter in the barn, the pigs are going to suffer from heat stress more. Um, interestingly, what we found is that sometimes the ambient temperature in the barn isn't necessarily predictive of that animal's body temperature. Sometimes um, we find that, you know, even if we do a very controlled heat stress, you know, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon when they've been exposed to very high heat stress, yeah, their body's high. But then you start to cool it down and by about 7, 8 p.m., their body temperature actually gets much higher than at the peak. Um, and if you look at the behavioral data, um, we actually find that it's really highly associated with just increased feed intake. Okay. Um, and so they're, they're, you know, they're not eating, they're, they're using behavior, they go down and then all of a sudden they eat and it's super high again. Um, and so that's kind of where, you know, I would, I would suggest, you know, using multiple input measures to identify when an animal is actually suffering from heat stress. Because if you were to plot that animal's body temperature over a 24 hour period and say, I'm gonna say body temperature by increasing ambient temperature, you might actually get a negative slope and say, oh, well, when it's hotter out there, it actually got cooler. So this is a really tolerant animal. Well, that's just because at 7 p.m. it ate a bunch of feed. It got really hot and it actually looks like at, you know, at 70 degrees, it's super hot. And wow, it's heat stress at 70. Um, but if you didn't have that, you know, that feed intake data or behavioral data, I know there's, you know, folks are implementing cameras in their facilities. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't know that. So that's that's why. At least, and I know a lot of people. Their research, we try to use a very multidisciplinary, you know, many measures to address this issue because, you know, heat is a is a multidisciplinary heat stress is a multidisciplinary type problem that needs a lot of people to address it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I I think you bring up a good point. At least I know in the barns we always talked about two o'clock being the hottest part of the day, but even within the barn, really the hottest part of the day was between two and five. Mm -hmm. So after the sun was starting to lose its intensity, we still, in terms of monitoring for heat stress, it was actually later in the day. So, um, and that was well before the animals would get up and eat. So you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. It's people understanding how that, the shift in the temperature and, and how that animal responds to that heat stress is gonna be critical mm -hmm. to just managing her daily comfort. Right. We're not even talking long term, just day to day comfort. Yeah. And, 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 and on that is, you know, by the time you realize the animal's heat stressed, it's too late to do much about it. Right. Because it's, you know, it's just difficult. And so really kind of going back to those thresholds, understanding when it's likely to start occurring is really key because, you know, you need to start doing your preventative measures well before they start lying on their side and showing signs of heat stress. Uh, because again, at that point, it's it's almost too late, right? You've already hit that threshold. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anything else you'd like to share with our group about heat stress? You know, I you know, I just obviously it takes a it takes a, a multidisciplinary team, I think, to, to address the issue. I, I try to reiterate that quite a bit. I know in our research we use all sorts of you know different measures between behavior and nutrition and physiology and all that. Um, and I, I definitely see that happening, especially on the research side of things where you, you get all these groups of people working together. Um, and, and I also think too, you know, getting out of getting out of your lab and going on farm and talking to some of the swine managers um, and seeing what their problems are, are, are also very key to, to helping us solve some of these problems too. Um, so I would encourage any, any research that are doing this, and I know many of them do, to, 
to get out in the facilities and to to talk to some of these these uh, swine farm technicians and managers and really see what issues they're seeing on a daily basis. I know certainly in some of our newer boar studs, they're putting in air conditioning units to obviously try to mitigate the negative impacts of heat stress on sperm production. Do you see that happening in the south farms? The ones that I've been to, I mean, of course, I'm in the northern Midwestern area. Um, I, I've not seen that. I've seen, um, I've seen, you know, pretty good indoor ventilation systems that have worked. Um, but again, you know, our, our heat stress threshold, especially with our current genetics, sometimes when it gets really hot, they just still can't keep up, um, unfortunately, at least in the ones that I've been able to visit. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. So I think you brought up some very good points today, particularly in, in helping us recognize that when we look at heat stress in the barn today, most of us would say, you know, we're addressing the situation as it's occurring. We know every day we know that heat stress is reducing growth performance, impacting feed efficiency, um, and doing those immediate things that we would anticipate, potentially even causing some increase in mortality if the animals are not adapting and, and handling the stress well. But you also brought in some very interesting concepts about the in utero impact of heat stress and how it could potentially negatively impact our animals down the road. So I think that um, that really gives us something to think about. It, it might make a few people a little bit nervous because that's a little bit harder to control. But I think, again, if we understand that maybe these animals are going to be more uh, heat sensitive or heat intolerant, then, you know, we might have to consider to think about what else we're going to do from a technology perspective or just a general management approach. So I think, Jim, you brought up some very interesting points today. Um, are there any other key points that you'd like our audience to remember from today? I guess, you know, kind of getting back to the point of, you know, when is heat stress occurring? Um, I guess my only suggestion would be listen to your animals. And I know our swine producers are excellent at that. Um, and so just, just listen to your animals, you know, be sure that you're identifying what is their baseline, how do they normally act versus you know, how are they reacting to the different environmental conditions? And, you know, I, I definitely think that's the first step and probably the main step in, in preventing some of these issues that, I, that we were describing, like in utero heat stress and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Well, Jay, as we kind of wrap up our time together, as you know, we like to ask our guest speakers a couple of questions that everybody gets asked. Sure. So the, the first question I'm going to ask you is what is your favorite swine resource book? Well, there's several that I go to, but I, I probably say the, the one I go to the most, um, just in some of our nutrition-based research, is the NRC. Um, yeah, I, I probably see that at least twice a twice a week, if not three times a week. Um, just checking things, helping my students with diet tables and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty common common yeah, swine resource. I would book. say so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about something that's not swine related? Is there any sure. books that you'd recommend to our group? Yeah, there's a there's a really good book. Um, you know, I, I think it's written for more of a general audience, but it's uh, called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. It's by Robert Sapolsky. He's a stress physiologist, and it really helps. You know, it really helps describe some of the stress response processes that are occurring um, in a way that I think many people can understand. Um, it's a it's a book that I give to my students when they come in the lab right away. So you know, read this and. You know, it, it's an interesting read. It can be entertaining. Mm -hmm. That is very entertaining. I'll have to pick that one yeah. up. I, yeah. I love the title, at least. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty certainly good. catching. Yeah. <laughs> Lastly, um, we like to have you think a little bit about somebody or a couple of people that you feel are successful in the industry, and you can define that however you want. Um, but when you think about those individuals, are there any key characteristics or traits that stand out to you that that help? has helped them be successful? I think the key trait is really the ability to bring together people from different backgrounds um, to address issues, right? You know, the ability to identify good collaborators, um, people that are gonna help advance the research and advance the knowledge to help the swine industry. Um, I've seen several people in, in the industry in both research and, and otherwise that have been really great at that. Um, and, and that's something I really admire about them. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a very good characteristic to have. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, again, Jay, I do want to thank you for your time today. We greatly appreciate having you in to give our uh, listeners a little bit of information on heat stress. Um, for those of you who are listening, um, this is Dr. Jay Johnson. I'm sure he would be happy to entertain any questions that you may have via email um, down the road on heat stress. So again, Jay, thank you for your time today. Well, thank you. I appreciate you inviting me. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.